to paraphrase a former prime minister, if you want something said, ask a man. If you want something done, go ask a woman. The person I'm meeting today, one of the few female leaders in the renewable energy sector, has the fortitude of a Margaret Thatcher and the equanimity of a Buddhist monk. Join me as I meet and have a proper chat with Ruth Yu Owen tonight on Thought Leaders. So, <laughs> Ruth, this is perfect. We're at our favorite watering hole, yeah. a nice reunion, and I get to tell everybody else about your life, your roots, how you've never forgotten them, and how you've built on that as a successful career in life. Now, I want to start from the very beginning, Ruth, telling us about how you grew up in the su in Southern Philippines, mm -hmm. and what it meant to you to become from that beautiful area. Yeah. Well, obviously, I'm very proud of my roots. In fact, um, <coughs> I come from Zamboanga City, city of flowers. I went to Chinese school. My, my, my parents, you know, were sort of average family. But the, being in a Chinese school, it's like, you know, all these rich kids go there. So I felt like, you know, I don't, I, I don't belong. But luckily, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like good in academics and you know, top of my class. So, you know, so I, I get some scholarship and, and stuff like that. So um, when I went to college, um, my aunt sent me to school because my parents couldn't afford it. I went to Ateneo de Zamboanga. I took up accountancy. Wait, I, uh, let me interrupt you there. I mean, accountancy was obviously a practical course for your family, but initially I understand you wanted to take mass communications. Well, That's why the shift. It's more like my personality, but my sister was already mass com graduate. So um, my father wanted me to be an accountant, you know, typical Chinese. So I just did it, but I have no passion never practice accountancy. You know, Ruth, what I find interesting is that you represent two strong cultures. I mean, you grew up a uh, Chinese family, but deep inside you also had the, in your veins uh, the f uh, blood was, flow was flowing of a Tao Sug. So tell us about how those two come together or came together when you were growing up as an identity. Yeah, well, I think it's a Tao Sug in me that makes me more outspoken. Um, I'm kind of very direct and just straight to the point. Um, the Chinese side of me, I think, is the business side. That's when, you know, when I talk to someone, there's always, you know, I always come, it just comes naturally to me, like, you know, okay, maybe we can do something, <laughs> you know, do some business out of this. And, you know, and then along with this Tao Tzu trait, I think, is, is a good combination. You know. From the south in Zamboanga, you moved to big Manila. Yeah. What was it like coming in to the big city and finding your way into a career? I applied to be, uh, I've always wanted to be uh, a med rep because that in Zamboanga we see them, you know, with cars. So, um, so I applied to be a med rep and took the exams. And after that, there were like these two ladies that said, well, there's another company that needs an account executive. And I said, well, okay, might as well, right? So took the exams and passed both. So now it's a crossroad, you know. In which, you, co in which company was it? Another sector. It was sector? an international shipping company. Okay, another, in the port another world away. Yeah, it yeah. was like I have no idea what they do, right? So the international shipping is offering me two thousand peso. That was in nineteen eighty six, and the Madrep company, the pharma company, gave me the same. The difference is I I get five hundred peso transportation allowance, and you know that's a lot of money at that time. So I thought, well. Might as well give this a try. If it doesn't work, go back. You can always go back, yes. So that's how I started my career in international shipping. Now, it's interesting because that's uh, the first of two industries that I know are very male-dominated, still are. Yeah. How did you make your way up with your gender, but at the same time mm -hmm. with a very, very firm personality? I think I was given a chance um, when I was with Smith Bell. It's, uh, it's one of the oldest companies in the Philippines, and it was a shipping company. So <clears throat> it was just hard work, pure hard work. You know, I travel. I think networking is one of my stronger traits. Um, I, I, um, when I travel, I create contacts and, and translate that to business. Um, at the same time, you know, you, when, when you deliver on what you say you're going to deliver, you, you earn respect. And I think that way um, you survive in a way, right? You weren't even 30 yet, and you already rose to become vice president of the company. Tell us how 
challenging was it to prove yourself in your 20s to get there? And what else did you have to do to learn to groom yourself into that position and own it? Well, of course, it's a hit and miss, right? It wasn't like a walk in the park, you know, it was, you were young, people are, you know, it's a big company and uh, there are people that have worked there for a long time and, you know, the expectations are high and, you know, most people are probably happy to see you fail. And I think um, the challenge was actually something that I took on and, um, and, and ran with it, basically. Now, Smithville being a multinational company with a presence in the Philippines also had many, um, I'd say, arms and legs in terms of the kind of opportunities you had. But before we go into that, you also had a reward to meeting all your challenges, which is you actually met your future husband at Smith Bell. Yes, I met Bob. He's uh, Welsh, almost British. Um, he's, uh, he was a uh, chief engineer on a cable ship, and we were the agents, and there was a Christmas party. And uh, yeah, that's, how, that's how we met, actually. Now, you grew a family while growing your respective careers. How did you balance everything together in a tough industry with a husband who was in the same line of work, more or less, and a son who was growing up on his own also because he had no siblings. Tell us how it all worked out. Um, yeah, I think my husband, Bob, has always been supportive. Never, never the one to question me, you know, when I need to work long hours, traveling on my own. And I think it's a, it's a very good relationship that way. Of course, I'm my own person and, and Bob lets me, you know, spread my wings and just and do my thing, but um, I think women are natural multitaskers as well, you know, it's like a juggling act, your family, your work, and it works perfectly because um, I also believe in, you know, working hard and playing hard, so I have, I'm balanced, like uh, on weekends we play golf, scuba diving is the sports, that, that one of those things that we also enjoy doing as a family. Now, if you look at your career in hindsight, that there's a 16-year career in Smith & Bell, were there any compromises that you have to make, any regrets that you looked at going back and saying, could I have changed something uh, if I had a chance? I think every aspect of what happens to you in life is actually um, a point where you, you go through so that you, you learn from it. And um, I've never regretted anything but I always try and learn from it. So Ruth, you invested a 16-year career in Smith Bell, rose to vice president at a young age of 29. You were very comfortable, and yet you chose to leave the company to branch off into what you think or you thought was better pastures. Tell us about what led to that decision. Did you have a mentor involved in making the decision and how did it all pan out? Back in 1999, in Sydney, I met Mr. Bumasang, Bumi. Everyone calls him Bumi. Um, he, he was talking about renewable energy. He said, that is the way to the future. And, you know, um, incidentally or ironically, it was a coal conference. <laughs> and then there he was telling me, you should go into renewable energy, it's a way to the future. And I said, okay, let me talk to Smith Bell and see you know, if we can do something. And that's how we started. Long before renewable energy was a byword in the Philippines, uh, we've already started doing uh, a wind power project in San Carlos. But at that time, uh, there was no renewable energy law. No incentives you know. yet, right? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So no incentives. Um, you know, the, the rates are not attractive enough to make it viable, so it wasn't that successful. In this energy industry, did you find the same challenges you had in the shipping industry? Male-dominated, very technologically heavy, uh, challenging sector. How did you manage uh, in this industry? You know, I don't think um, there, is that, um, there is that difference between male and female. I don't see it like that. When I go into something, I see a fair play. You know, it's actually your attitude, your, your work ethics, your, um, how you deal with people. Those things are important. I love it, the fact that you're looking at it from a gender, genderless point of view or a gender blind point of view. And it, it feels like almost when people watch a show, they should see things 
as they are. You have a level playing field in front of you, or as I know you, you make the, <laughs> you make the playing field level enough for people to actually succeed, which I've seen in your life as well. So what I want to ask you next is when you decided not just to go into energy or renewable energy at that, as an intrapreneur within Smith Bell, but you actually broke free and set up your own yes. energy business called Phil Carbon. Tell us how that came about, what risks you had, and what were the payoffs? Yeah, okay, so Phil Carbon is a company I put up when I left Smith Bell, and um, I've decided that I, this is the, the path I want to take now. I've spent a lot of time in international shipping, and I thought, I want to do something that makes an impact in people's lives, you know, and, and, and I've never felt that, unfortunately, when I was doing international shipping, but felt really passionate about um, doing what I was doing um, at that time when I started. But continue, it was hard. It was very hard. It was like starting all over again. And how old was I? I almost been about uh, early 40s. You know, early 40s, some people have settled in, you know, they're happy. So I was starting to, you know, develop this business. But of course, um, the renewable energy law was just happening, not, not yet passed. But, you know, so, so there were so, so many obstacles. And there are days, Kinti, and I tell you that I just feel like I needed to crawl back to bed and stay there. But what, what makes me stand up again is, is that I, I just feel like, you know, I read somewhere that they say, doesn't matter how you feel, just turn up. And I have, I have um, met so many people that have done business with us, have partnered with us in functions where I felt like, I don't really want to go. And then I changed my mind, went and found my partners. I got, uh, you know, Mega Wide Construction who wanted to go into renewable energy. So we're partners, um, we're developing uh, solar projects, um, biomass, hydropower, and th those types. And then we have the Belgian partners that are into energy efficiency and renewable energy. You know, Ruth, it must have been a massive transition. Here you are in your 40s, um, trying to break out into a new company, into a very challenging industry. Um, and I know it would, in your own powers, you could have done it, but you, you yourself admit you've gotten some help also along the way. How did your husband Bob and your mentor Boomi come together and make you uh, succeed in this transition? Well, Boomi, Boomi, I've asked Boomi to be my chairman, and Boomi, being a respected figure in, 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 this, in the energy sector, has uh, helped us a lot too because uh, uh, prospective partners actually check us out and they, they find that you know, we, we're experienced and, and we have a good reputation. Well, Bob has always been supportive, you know, also financially, emotionally, and everything. Tell us about a time where you had a failure and how you got over that. What gave you the will to succeed despite these obstacles that you were mentioning? Passion. I'm passionate about it. I knew where I was going, and I'm, I'm very aware with what was happening, you know, the emergence of the renewable energy law. It's a matter of time, you know, that it picked up. And it did pick up. So that was, I think that was it, you know, when you believe in something, it's, it's, there's no way it cannot happen. And can you give us an example of one of the failures you had? So for our audience members, what are they looking at in terms of uh, a specific failure and how that was overcome with that grit and passion you were talking about? Well, the Sagada project. Um, the, we have uh, a wind power project in Sagada, as you know. Um, it's actually the hometown of Bumi, my yeah, you chairman. Had, so you had, you had inherent advantages already. Yes. What happened? W tell us what happened and why it didn't work. Well, we had some issues with the indigenous people. We, we put up a 100 meter met mass and one day, you know, that they toppled it down and you know, it's just, um, it's rather unfortunate that they see it in a negative way when Bumi, in fact, was the one that recommended this place. He said, it's very windy here. You know, I was w walking here for so many times when I was a kid and the Japanese made a study. There is a very good wind potential here. But, you know, that, that, that failed because of the resistance from, from the indigenous people. And, and how do you move on from a setback like that? I mean, is it something you carry with you or you just put closure on and then move on to the next project? I move on. I move on because it helps. 
um, if I didn't move on, I wouldn't have, um, I would have just given up, you know? I would have just said, okay, why don't I just work for one of those big conglomerates and be a vice president for something? But that's not me. My passion just takes me there. Ruthio, you cut your teeth with a series of experiences, some of them failures, and you got all over them quite nicely, moving on. But you're still in a sector that's very challenging and has an up-and-coming role in the Philippines. What do you think that role is? Is it a game changer for the Philippines? Well, you know, the COP21 in Paris was quite successful as far as renewable energy is concerned. Uh, 192 countries actually said that we want to do something you know, on climate change. And we've already felt the, the impact of this decision as uh, lots of uh, investors are coming in and they're looking into renewable energy projects. And the Philippines has a vast resources of renewable energy that is out there and just waiting to be developed. And now, um, you're also one of the smaller players in a very large universe of competitors. And some of them are still pushing for coal and other environmentally difficult uh, sources of energy. Mm -hmm. How do you propose in your strategy to overcome that? Well, there's always room for um, renewable energy. I think it's an energy independence that, uh, that we want in the, in the country. Uh, that means we're not reliant on coal or fossil fuel. We have it here. And, and so I don't think there is um, a real competition to that. Well, Ruth, in light of all these challenges and opportunities in such a sector, how does the renewable energy sector play a role in the Philippines? And how do you see it evolving in the next 10 years? And more importantly, how do you see FU and Phil Carbon playing that role in it? The, the Department of Energy is also very supportive in growing renewable energy in the Philippines. And Phil Carbon, being um, you know, a developer of renewable energy, is also out there developing projects now. And um, we feel that in the next five years, we will be uh, bigger than, than what we are now. now one of the things I want to know is to keep up this pace and energy, so to speak. You must have, you must have a wonderful work-life balance. How do you do this? Is that uh, connected to what you do with the Art of Living? Oh yes, the Art of Living Foundation. It's a, it's a non-profit organization present in so many places around the world. And it actually teaches people how to do breathing technique, to relax you and do meditation. But it, also, most importantly, is uh, out there um, helping people during calamities, you know, like fire, floods, typhoon, etc. And tell me how early in your life did you get into it? Were you a late bloomer coming into this uh, movement? Um, I started in 2007, and I'm kind of like a regular volunteer. Um, but I love, I love it because it centers me. You know, meditation actually um, makes everything around me uh, more tolerable. So no matter how difficult the situation, you have something to center you with? Yeah, you just close your eyes and then, you know, you're, you're just peace. How much of that work-life balance through the art of living has made you successful? To what extent has that actually changed your life? Oh, I think I'm a better person now. You know, I <clears throat> meditation and I do like a silent meditation once a year, once or twice. And every time I come back, um, I, I just become the person that I wanted to be, more forgiving and more um, well, kinder, kinder to people. And you know, it seems to be like getting fully centered in your life also means paying forward yes. in your life. And talk to us about how you were able to give back or continue to give back to Zamboanga through your newest project. Well, this project actually is a 10-year-old project. It's called Panca de Dia. It's under the Ateneo de Zamboanga uh, scholarship program. It's a food subsidy program where we started with 20 students and now we're feeding 60 students every day by giving them uh, lunch coupons. So once a year, I go home and put up uh, a golf tournament together with the Ateneo Alumni Association of Zamboanga. It's a fundraising. It's a fundraising to continue, you know, to sustain the, the feeding program, and I'm proud of it. Well, you know, there's a lot to be proud of, a wonderful family, a career you can look back on and not forget any single bit. Yeah. 
and the way of living that makes things balanced, centered, and always forward-looking. So I really appreciate you sharing that story with us. Thanks and for And wish you me. all the best as that journey unfolds. Thank you very That's much. <laughs>